Now, circling back to candidates and important issues conveniently avoided during the debates, we sat down with Maryland Green Party senatorial candidate Dr. Margaret Flowers to get a scoop on the health care, or rather sick care, system. Before becoming a full-time activist, Flowers was a practicing pediatrician in both large hospitals and smaller private practices. She's done an impressive amount of work fighting for a single-payer health care system, among other things, like the TPP. And because the issue hasn't gotten much play on the presidential stage, it seemed appropriate to go to someone who has seen the system from both the inside and the outside. Take a look. Our healthcare system is not about health. So when I was a hospitalist at a rural hospital, when patients would come in, the first person I would have to talk to after we decided to admit them was the utilization review, where we had to start bargaining for how many days they could have in the hospital. And it had nothing to do with like yeah. what they actually needed. So then in private practice after that, same kind of thing, constantly fighting with insurance companies, taking time away from time with patients and being forced to spend less time with patients. I think that's yeah. really disturbing to me is how physicians these days are driven to spend less and less time with patients and it, that provides poor quality care. So um, that was why I left practice in 2007 to see what I could do to fix this system, especially because I also saw my friends and colleagues who I thought were really good doctors leaving practice and going into kind of medical directorships and things like that. And it was just like this real... Um, it was just pushing everything in the wrong direction. So, so uh, with that understanding your background, help us understand the structure as it is today. And a while back, there was this whole EpiPen thing, uh, and the um, where it had risen over four hundred percent in the past six years, the price of the EpiPen. And the CEO mm -hmm. of the company went on television and basically said, "Look, it's not my fault." It's the insurance companies, and we're, we, we, have to, we have to go with their hike of prices. Talk about that structure, and whose fault is it? Is it both of them? What's going on? Yeah, how unusual that they would be shifting the blame right? somewhere else. Yeah. Um, the, the fault is our system, is the fact that we have a market-based system for healthcare in the United States, where we treat healthcare as a commodity and not as a public good. And we're an outlier because of that. Most yeah. other civilized countries do not treat healthcare that way. So really in a market system, the incentive is charge as much as you can. So it's really the fact that we just don't have a system that allows there to be any kind of rational pricing. And that's part of the reason why I fight for a national improved Medicare for all healthcare system. So with that, like speaking of the system, I mean, it was bad before the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And um, how does the Affordable Care Act fit into, into that a picture of the system as it stands, and also the the public option, which I know that you wrote an article recently calling it the profiteers option. Mm -hmm. Talk about talk about that. Sure. So the Affordable Care Act actually took us in you know worsened kind of our healthcare system. People don't recognize that because um, it was sold as something very different from what it actually is. But if you think about kind of a typical neoliberal a plan, if people are familiar with that word in the U.S., um, basically what it did is it drives, it's driving further privatization of our healthcare system and consolidation of it. We're seeing health insurance companies, uh, you know, merge. We're seeing um, major, like, hospital medical complexes merging. Um, and it's taking over $100 billion of our taxpayer dollars a year to subsidize the purchase of private insurance. So that money is going straight into the hands of the private insurers. So we're just shifting public dollars into private hands. And we're also reinsuring the insurance companies so that they don't have to spend too much on actual health care. Like, it makes no sense when you start to break it down. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And so um, right now, the private health insurance companies are screaming because not not enough healthy people have um, you know bought health insurance, right. and so they're having to actually pay for health care. <laughs> so oh, damn it. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? You look for a place to dump those healthy patients, and that's what the public public option. That's why I call it the profiteers option, is raising its head again. It's exactly what they want. In the past, when we've done at the state level a state public health insurance, basically what it happens is the health insurers are so good at incentivizing patients who need actual care to leave by making it complicated or using advertising to attract healthy patients. So 
those patients are all going to go into the public system. It's going to carry the greater financial burden. It's going to have to cut back on people that it covers. It's going to have to cut back on services. It will eventually fail. And meanwhile, the private insurers are going to continue to make, you know, outrageous amounts of money and pay themselves outrageous salaries. And so it was the the profiteers option was used in 2009 and 2010 to confuse people and make them believe that it would actually solve the health care problem. But we have to recognize that that's not true and that it's just another insurance and a morass of insurances. And one of our biggest problems is that we spend so much money on paperwork and adding another insurance just adds more paperwork and complicates the system more. We need to just say, we can't be fooled, we have to just say, no, we're going to fight for a single payer national improved Medicare for all instead. So, and, and that's what's so interesting because the ACA is far more bureaucratic mm -hmm. than Medicare for all would be, not just because of the mandatory uh, insurance or penalties paid that, you know, if you don't choose to use insurance, but the billions spent, about a 400 billion a year on insurance company operating costs. Talk about, I mean, I don't even understand how you can spend so much money on operating costs. I mean, what, what are these operating costs and, and talk about how Medicare for All would ease all of this and actually end up saving us so much money. Yeah, I was just smiling because I when I do presentations on this, I have this one uh, slide that I show and it's kind of a, a graph with a, a low slope line at the bottom with the growth of health professionals and then this like giant mountain <laughs> above it which is all the administrators like mm -hmm. a three thousand percent increase in administrators wow. since you know over the last like 30 years so think about our system you have people that are designing health insurance plans marketing those health insurance plans and then you have people in businesses that are you know hiring consultants to help them figure out what the health insurance plans do <laughs> yeah. so which one do i buy then it's uh, then it's where do I go? Where can I go? Mm. What do I pay? What do they pay? I mean, we just have this incredibly complex system. We we micromanage. If you've if you've ever stayed in the hospital, you know that they are they're charging you for the band aid, for the aspirin, for like literally everything. Your little shoey things that you put on your foot. I mean, it's like it's crazy, and that's what our system has become. And then on the on the health professional end as physicians, we have to hire staff to help us interface with the health insurance companies and they do everything they can to delay and avoid paying. So you're constantly on the phone, you're constantly faxing more papers and it's ridiculous and there's hundreds of plans and they all have different rules. Mm -hmm. So this is just ridiculous. Um, so if we had a, a national improved Medicare for all where everybody was in the system, one set of rules for everybody, it's comprehensive, it puts the decision-making capacity back into the hands of health professionals and patients instead of these administrators that are trying to blockade it. We could spend 10% or less on administration and people wouldn't have copays and deductibles, they would just, mm -hmm. you need care, you go get the care, yeah. doctor submits it to the system, the system pays them back. In France, they pay back, they pay the doctors within five days. They don't even have like office staff except for assistants in France. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be like it would be so much easier for patients, but it would also be so much easier for health professionals. Mm -hmm. And it's the complication that's driving primary care docs out of practice within ten to fifteen years right now. And in, in that same vein, it's also doctors are now incentivized to get people to take a bunch of medicine because they get they get a, a piece of that pie. Talk about, I mean, especially as a doctor, if you, you know, the Hippocratic Oath and like wanting to mm -hmm. help people and yet then you're sh trying to like shove medicine. What, what's that whole? Well, I think part of, so a big, another big problem in this country is the direct to consumer advertising. Of, so we have pharmaceutical companies that are having ads everywhere telling yeah. people that they if you don't feel perfect and the sky's yeah. not sunny all day and you're not <laughs> bouncing through the flowers that you need something and so um patients come in with a preconceived idea that they need something uh doctors don't have the time to really sit the town and talk to them and run through it patients want something they're not going to feel satisfied they're not going to come back if they don't leave the office with something but doctors also want to do something and they don't have a lot of time so it's just it has really created this situation where um we're using way too many medications. And they actually send pharmaceutical representatives in to shadow the physicians in their offices and like actually see how they interact with patients. And you know, are they, are they reporting back? Like they didn't prescribe this medication. Yeah. And they're getting pharmaceutical data from the pharmacist so that they can say to a physician, hey, you know, we sent you to this conference, we paid for your nice hotel and your car, but we're looking at your prescribing rate and it's not very high. So yeah, it's really messed up. 
for sure. Clearly. <laughs> um, so it, thinking about how how much of a mess this is on both sides, big pharma and the just the our system in terms of insurance, is single payer something that can be done in one fell swoop, or do we have to take steps? Like, would there be something like a legitimate Affordable Care Act that would be a, a step in the right direction, or is this just one? It's one. Yeah, I, for um, decades now, because I've been looking into this, we've tried to tweak the current system, mm -hmm. and every single time we've done it, it has failed. We continue in the same path. And so the lowest incremental step that we can take right now is to just create, immediately expand, you know, a national, traditional, publicly financed Medicare to every single person. Mm -hmm. That gives us the ability to simplify the administration, which gives us the cost savings so that we can provide comprehensive benefits. It allows us to negotiate for fair prices for services and pharmaceuticals, and it also allows us to give hospitals operating budgets so that they're not having to micromanage everything right. and they can just focus on taking care of patients that walk in the door so that there's much more clinical interaction. So, I mean, this is always that question that, you know, you get from the, the naysayers who say what well, won't work, and you hear about this a lot with the environment, like, well, what are you going to do with all the people who work on pipelines? Uh, so what do you, I mean, this would cause an em enormous shift also in, in, in terms of jobs and, and the economy that's built on, you know, pharmaceutical reps and the, mm -hmm. all those people uh, <laughs> with the stacks of paper that they don't need to have. What what happens with that huge section of the job market? So a couple of things. One is that we still will have a lot of need for people to be involved in the healthcare system, both administering it, but also providing direct care. We we, we don't have enough people that are doing home care, um, you know, social workers, mm -hmm. uh, case managers, all these things that actually create an optimal healthcare system. Um, I also think that health professionals that have gone into the system to do administrative work because they're so frustrated with providing care, hopefully a lot of them will come back into the system. Um, the legislation that we support, H.R. 676, Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act, actually has provisions so anybody who's displaced uh, from the healthcare system because of the law gets two years for retraining and salary mm -hmm. support. And, then, and they're also prioritized to be hired into the system. Um, but there was also an economic study that was done in 2009 by the, uh, I can't remember, it was a group out in California that did mm. it. Uh, any ba they basically looked at the big picture and found that if we did a single-payer healthcare system, it would create more than 2 million jobs. Right. And part of that is also because, think about it, when people have discretionary funds that they're not you know, paying insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs, yeah. People actually have money to spend, and they'll spend it on food and clothing and all these things, and that actually creates a stimulus from the bottom up. So, yeah, there's a lot of pluses to it. Yeah, and not obviously just in the healthcare system, just it's, in... Yeah. yeah, and being free to leave your job and not having to worry about whether your healthcare will transfer. If people want to form new businesses, they can right. be free to do that. I mean, there's it's really like, for people that are like libertarian, when we talk about like the freedom, like freedom of choice, freedom to live your life the way you want to, a lot of them actually get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because again, you know, going back to the bureaucracy, like nothing irritates a libertarian more than the bureaucracy of the <laughs> right, government. Right, and if you right. take all, out all the red it. tape, then yeah. I mean... Yeah, and when people think like, well, this can't be done, we've been trying for 100 years, there's no way we can do this. The I look at like the political reality versus the reality reality. So the reality reality is we have a healthcare crisis and that yeah. exists, it's not going away. The political reality is whether we can get the votes or political support to actually create that system. And that's a changeable factor. Right. And in 2009, 2010, um, we, I was part of a very large coalition that was pushing for single payer, but then we also kind of broke off into a smaller group that was a little more agile and able to kind of be in there every day, figuring out where we could push and being willing to use some, you know, not just lobbying, but also protesting yeah. uh, to try to push on the system. And we were successful in getting a single-payer amendment to the floor of the Senate on December 16th of 2009 with just a small group of us without a lot in the way of resources. Mm -hmm. And that, it was there for three hours. And then actually a, a doctor, a senator from Oklahoma, Tom Coburn, killed it using a parliamentary maneuver. But 
it showed me that we can, we can, you know, if we work strategically and effectively, we can get this through. We just have to believe that we can do it and not get distracted with these things like the profiteer option, which is why I want people to understand that right now. Don't think of it as a public option. Yeah. That sounds good. It's a profiteer's <laughs> option. It's exactly what the health insurance companies want. So basically what people need to be doing from the outside is educate people around you that the profiteer's option is not a solution. We need single payer. Uh, organize in your communities and there are organizations like Healthcare Now is a national grassroots single payer group, Physicians for National Health Program that I'm part of. You don't have to be a physician to join it, but you can also invite people from that group to come to your group and speak to people about what's going on. And then just contacting your members of Congress and just being really clear. No to the profiteer's option, yes to single payer. Hypothetically, let's just say that we were able to have, we were able to put into effect an, a single payer healthcare system, but TPP passes. What would that do to that single payer healthcare system? So the, the TPP, the provision that changes our laws, well, it does it in two ways. One is that whatever they wrote into it, um, the, the, all those corporate lobbyists that wrote it, we're going to have to change our current laws to be consistent with it. Right. But then down the road, if we create a new law that interferes with their profits, then they can sue us for billions of dollars. So basically, um, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership passed, it's going to prevent us from ever being able to do a single-payer system. That's another reason why we have to stop the TPP this fall during the lame duck session. To learn more about Margaret's campaign for Senate, visit flowersforsenate.org. And to get in the loop on activist news, check out Popular Resistance. And be sure to sign up for their awesome newsletter at popularresistance.org. Margaret is also the co-founder of the aforementioned Flush the TPP, so be sure to check that out. And remember, sign up for the upcoming actions at flushthetpp.org.